Native Americans had to live off the land but sustain it as well. Many tribes used techniques such as burning to clear forests, which made room for fields that were used to grow crops and feed animals that the Native Americans hunted. However, they still had great respect for nature. Nature was a key part of many Native American cultures' spirituality. Beliefs such as the Iroquois Arenda, which stated that all objects, animals, and humans have an inherent spiritual power, were common among Native American cultures and cultivated respect for the environment. The Navajo actually prayed to the deer and asked for forgiveness before hunting. Despite their respect for nature, it was still possible for Native Americans to deplete the resources of the land if they stayed in one place for too long. Because of this, they tended to move around a lot. Many tribes had summer and winter camps that they lived in seasonally so that they didn't overwork the land. When the European colonists arrived in the early 1600s, they, they saw seemingly endless land for the taking. As such, they cared not at all about conservation. Many Europeans also feared the forests. Not only did the forest hold real dangers such as wolves, bears, and hostile Native Americans, but European mythology often portrayed forests as mysterious and dangerous. Just think of stories like Little Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel. This combination led to the Europeans cutting down forests without hesitation to make room for farms and to get lumber for houses. Also, because European culture emphasized settling and living in one place, Europeans often depleted the soil and were forced to move to new farms rather than maintaining one piece of land for a long time. This, immigration, and, and the growth of the colonies only increased the rate of deforestation. Then the Revolutionary War happened. After the colonists won independence, they started looking inward at what they actually had in their new country. They saw beautiful wide open spaces and these became a huge source of national pride. This sparked the Transcendentalist movement and marked the first sign of environmentalism in the United States. Transcendentalist authors Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau argued that people needed to return to nature for spiritual guidance and that at least some nature should be set aside and preserved. The Hudson River School created artists who painted the American landscapes and further encouraged the thought that nature was something to be appreciated. However, the second industrial revolution and the possibilities offered by the frontier led to an expansion of the view of nature as an undepletable source of resources during the second half of the 1800s. The government generally encouraged citizens to expand into the West without concern for the overuse of natural resources by offering public land for sale for farmers and miners at cheap prices with acts like the Homestead Act of 1862 and the General Mining Act of 1872. This led to environmental damage in terms of both mining and poor farming practices. The Second Industrial Revolution inspired greater exploration of oil and coal for industry and electrical power generation, leading to pollution from coal-fired power plants and from detrimental mining practices that only increased in the next two centuries. After the expansion and environmental damage of the industrial era, Americans began to realize that their resources were not, in fact, inexhaustible. The closing of the frontier in the 1890s was a wake-up call for many that America could not expand indefinitely without regard for the state of its environment. The first response to this realization was the preservation movement. Followers of this ideology believed that nature should not be violated and should be maintained in its untouched state of wilderness. One leading figure in the preservationist movement was John Muir. In his book, Our National Parks, published in 1901, Muir explained that the fate of the remnant of our forests is in the hands of the federal government, and if the remnant is to be saved at all, it must be saved quickly. Murr was instrumental in the founding of the Sierra Club in 1892 to advocate for the preservation of the land, especially in the West. Women were an important part of the Audubon Society's movement to protect American birds. Mrs. Augustus Hemingway formed a local society in Boston and encouraged fellow women to abstain from buying hats and dresses made with bird feathers. The Forest Reserve Act of 1891 demonstrated the preservationist mood of the time as it allowed the president to set aside forests as national par forests or parks and was used to preserve many acres in the following decade. Similarly, the first national park, Yellowstone, was established in 1872 partly because of the prevalent preservationist sentiment, but also in a large part due to commercial interest, namely railroad companies that understood the potential profits to them from a national park as a tourist attraction. Many more national parks were created in the following years, and in 1916, the National Park Service was established to manage national parks and monuments. A competing reaction to the realization of the finite nature of America's resources was the conservation movement. In opposition to both preservationists and business interests, interests, conservationists advocated for the regulated and efficient use of nature and resources so that they were conserved for future generations but were also available for current needs. Conservation became important, especially under President Theodore Roosevelt in the early 1900s. Roosevelt incorporated many of the goals of the preservation, preservationists in his policies by setting aside 125 million acres in federal forest reserves and establishing 51 federal bird reservations. Roosevelt also signed the Antiquities Act in 1906, which allowed the president to declare landmarks or objects to be national monuments. As president, Roosevelt declared 18 national monuments, and this act set a precedent of protecting archaeological sites. However, many preservationists criticized his other actions and departments, especially the U.S. Forest Service. 
first head of the service was Gifford Pinchot. Whereas Murr and the preservationists thought that nature was important for its own sake due to its spiritual inherent beauty, Pinchot promoted the rational use philosophy, or the idea that nature and forests should be preserved because of their economic benefits to humans. Rational use became the dominant ideology in America until the 1950s. Pinchot also in instituted multiple use resource management as the goal of the national forests. In 1913, despite the protests of Murr and other preservationists, Roosevelt approved the pro conservationist plan to build a dam on the Hetch Hetchy River in Yosemite National Park. The contra controversy over the dam offers a valuable example of the split in the early environmental movement between those who wanted to preserve nature in its pure form and those who wanted to conserve nature as a valuable resource to be used efficiently. Another key aspect of the early environmental movement was that it was largely composed of wealthy, well-educated white men with ample leisure time. Many of these men desired the preservation of nature for their outdoor hobbies, leading to accusations of elitism for the environmental movement that continued into later years. After the Roosevelt era, in the 1930s, the New Deal tied conservation to job creation with government organizations like the Civilian Conservation Corps, which employed young men in irrigation and conservation projects. World War I and World War II returned the focus to resource development, causing preservation and conservation to fade into the background of government policy as the demand for fuels and tools to fight the wars increased. The preservationist movement, angered by this change in governmental attitude, attempted to increase its unity and get its goals and opinions into the political arena. One key preservationist of the 1930s was Robert Marshall. Although he originally worked for the U.S. Forest Service, he soon began to criticize this agency for being too focused on tourism and on resource use instead of on preserving untouched wilderness. Marshall brought back the belief, tied to both the transcendentalists and the early preservationists, that unspoiled nature was spiritually important and spending time in such pure wilderness would benefit everyone. But Marshall also took a socialistic view of preservation in a reaction to the charges of environmentalists' elitism, calling for the government to provide transportation and camps at national parks so that all people, low and high income alike, could benefit from time in nature. Marshall and others formed the Wilderness Society in 1935 to promote the preservation of wilderness areas, separate from national parks and forests, that would not have any road access nor any recreation or resource use. The society would not be successful in this goal until the 1960s. In the mid-1950s, the environmental movement underwent a shift in perspective, largely due to the influence of Aldo Leopold. Observing that wilderness is a resource that can shrink but not grow, Leopold promoted the pres preservation of untouched areas of nature, but his biggest contribution to the environmental movement was the introduction of the perspective of the ecologist. Leopold's belief that people are a part of nature rather than its conquerors became an essential idea of the modern environmental movement. Leopold advocated for a land ethic, a code of conduct about the treatment of the environment like the code of conduct humans have about the treatment of other humans. Exemplifying the new ecological focus of the environmental movement, Scientists formed the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy in 1951 in an effort to prevent the loss of habitats crucial for plants and animals. The ecological viewpoint would continue to be important to the environmental movement throughout the rest of the 20th century. In 1962, following Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, environmental enthusiasm of the public rose to an all-time high. Ensuing was a flurry of legislative statutes and Supreme Court decisions that shaped environmental law today. In 1969, the National Environmental Policy Act was passed by Congress requiring federal agencies to take a hard look at the environmental impacts of their actions before proceeding. Although the statute has no substantive power of its own, the environmental impact statement it requires takes time, and during that time, environmental activists can accumulate enough political support to make it too expensive for the action to be carried out. For example, in the case of Washington County versus the U.S. Department of the Navy, the Navy wanted to create an outlying landing field in North Carolina near the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, an important habitat for migratory birds, to train Super Hornet aircrafts. The Navy did a final environmental impact statement, but the court found that it was not adequate. The Navy only did a quick drive-by at the site during a time when the birds were not present, and its bird aircraft strike hazard did not take into account the pilots' favor, since an impact between a bird and a plane could be fatal for both the bird and the pilots and the dense population of birds in the area would increase the chance of impact. During the time in which the Navy was preparing to do a new environmental impact statement, strong public and local resistance caused the project to be abandoned, saving countless human and avian lives. In 1973, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act, forbidding any agency or individual to take an endangered species. The word take, in 1995, was also redefined to include destruction of habitat in the case of Babbitt vs. Sweet Home. However, these acts did not come peacefully without controversy. Many people argued that the Endangered Species Act violated the Interstate Commerce Clause in the Constitution, which only allows the federal government to regulate interstate trade. In Charles Gilbert Gibbs v. Bruce Babbitt, 
the Supreme Court held that endangered red wolves that reside solely in North Carolina could be regulated by the Endangered Species Act because they contribute to research, peltry, and tourism, all of which were forms of interstate commerce. Congress continued to create environmental legislations, such as the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act. Additionally, a recent movement that has taken the stage is the Environmental Justice Movement, which was sparked in Warren County, North Carolina. It's been statistically proven that minorities and low-income communities reside in the most polluted areas and are often targeted to host facilities with negative environmental and health impacts that the more affluent populations are able to avoid by economic and political status. In 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898, requiring environmental agencies to make achieving environmental justice part of its mission. Sadly, there has only been one case where this order successfully prevented injustice. Through history, the treatment of the environment by Americans has rotated between spiritual veneration, profit-based exploitation, and logical conservation. Overall, modern awareness of environmental protection and its impacts on nature and health have greatly increased. Scientific research has brought this topic to the light and public groups are trying their best to increase awareness and fight for legislation. Sadly, occurrences such as oil spills and approval of destructive operations such as the construction of the Keystone Pipeline are still far too regular. In the polarized political climate of the 21st century, perspectives on the environment are often highly divided between those who want to make use of nature's benefits for humans and those who want to protect the environment, protect, prevent future damage, and remedy already present harm. Americans continue to overuse resources, but increasingly, technological development, such as the expansion in renewable energy technology, is focused on lessening human impact on the environment. Hopefully, in the future, Americans will be able to accomplish the goal of ecologists and live in true harmony with nature.